Assalamualaikum and good good evening, dear physicians. Today we have our 19th lecture, which is ECG in children, normal and abnormal. It is going to be delivered by our <coughs> Dr. Abdullah Jamil sir. Before going on to uh, starting the lecture, I request Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary sir to say some words about our <clears throat> Dr. Abdul Al Jamil sir. I request Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary sir to say some words. Wadud sir. Assalamu alaikum and very good to evening to everyone uh, in here in the Asian continent, uh, Asia. And I think it's good morning to Rafiq sir and Happy sir. <laughs> uh, last lecture, we had very good discussion about the normal pediatric ECG. Is variation of what to expect, how to do it, and all those things. Today, we'll be enjoying the next installment about the disease aspect that we can get from a pediatric ECG. And we are very fortunate that many eminent pediatrician, pediatric cardiologists are along with us. And that's a pleasure for us. And also, today we are getting two eminent uh, cardiologists, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed and Professor Chaudhary Habit Lafsan with us. So we'll be enjoying their comments and insight along with the lecture that will be given by Dr. Abdullah Al Jamil. We know about Dr. Abdullah Al Jamil. Uh, he's a consultant in Asgur Ali Hospital. He's a one in three, the three in one, sorry. He's a clinical cardiologist and interventional cardiologist, also an AP specialist. And today, he's trying to be something more. He's going to challenge the pediatric cardiologist whether they can find out something wrong with his lecture. And I think the challenge will be accepted by our eminent pediatrician cardiologists and we'll be enjoying a very good interactive session. Thank you. And Jamil Bhai, you can start now. Thank you, Professor Wadud. <coughs> uh, I, I shall talk about the abnormal ECG in children. Um, and uh, I tried to include most of the abnormalities in my lecture, but maybe there are some deficiencies. Uh, as because it's a very vast uh, subject. And hopefully it will cover everything. Can you see? My skin. We can yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk on the abnormal ECGs in children. Uh, Diagnosis of abnormal ECG in pediatrics uh, will require knowledge on normal ECG, what we have discussed in last Saturday. First, I come with the abnormal Q wedge, uh, that is atrial abnormality. In right atrial abnormality or right atrial enlargement, what is called the P pulmonary. The peak Q wave in lead two more than three millimeter from uh, neonate to six months of age of the children, or more than 2.5 millimeter when the age is more than six months. Causes includes right atrial volume overload, atrial septal defect, Epstein's anomaly, up quantum surgery. Left atrial abnormality or P mitrally wide notch Q wave in two, lead two, or biphasic in V1 causes usually 
mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation. So here is the right atrial enlargement, the stall and teeth, uh, almost more than three small uh, square, three millimeter. And in left atrial enlargement, there is a notched wide Q wave. And in lead V1, it's, uh, uh, there will be, a, the terminal part will be deep and a little wide. Some atrial uh, rhythms may have Q waves in front of every QRS, but with an abnormal Q, Q axis, it is invert, as for example, inverted in lead two and ABF, but upright in ABF. So this from the ectopic focus. Uh, this is an example of right atrial enlargement. You can see the tall peaked P wave is uh, near about four millimeter, what is called P uh, pulmonelli uh, in the two, three and a wave. And this is a uh, left atrial enlargement. The terminal part of the P wave in V1 is deep and wide, and it is notched. There's a small notch in the tall peak um, P wave in the two. This bi atrial enlargement here, the bi feet Q wave with amplitude more than two millimeter and duration more than 120 millisecond. So it is clearly seen in lead two with a notch. And uh, on the top of this um, large P wave, and in lead V1, an initial part is normal with uh, uh, it's not normal, it's peaked and sharp, and uh, terminal part is deep and wide, indicating uh, by trail enlargement. Now, the PR interval uh, abnormality prolonged PR interval that is first degree heart block, uh, usually uh, more than. 0.2 second or more equal to more than 200 millisecond or one big box. This may be normal in some children. Viral or rheumatic myocarditis and other myocardial dysfunctions causes this. Certain congenital heart disease like abstinence anomaly, endocardial cushion defect or atrial septal defect may be the cause. Digital this toxicity and hyperkalemia. Um, this prolonged PR interval, it is shown here, is quite um, long duration, more than, um, it's near about two large squares. Short PR interval occurs in pre excitation, as for example, WPW syndrome, this Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And another is a glycogen storage disease. Variable PR interval occurs in wandering atrial pacemaker, this multifocal atrial tachycardia, and uh, in also in Mobius type one, one Quebec phenomenon. This is a uh, ECG of WPW syndrome with a short PR interval. In most of the leads, it can be discerned that there's a short PR interval and a delta wave. Variable PR interval is, is an example of one Quebec. Uh, it is the normal in lead two, this is the normal PR interval. It is slightly prolonged in next bit, and more prolonged in next bit. And uh, then it is dropped in the, uh, the P wave is there uh, in the bottom panel, but no QRS complex. And again, normal PR interval, pro gradual prolongation, prolongation, and again dropped here. <clears throat> prolongation of the QRS complex, uh, may, uh, the QRS duration. The prolongation may be due to bundle branch blocks, pre excitation like WPW, uh, intraventricular conduction defect or block, ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular hypertrophy, metabolic disturbances, and certain drugs. Diagnosis of ventricular hypertrophy by voltage criteria. So before going for the diagnosis, we have to uh, have a knowledge on this um, chart, uh, on this table, the normal values of the pediatric electrocardiogram. So according to age, it varies. 
uh, the QRS duration it uh, increases uh, with age, and uh, the amplitude also um, it gets reduced gradually uh, in uh, from V1 the tall R wave and smallest wave with age it uh, goes towards the adult phase and in the V6 also similar reciprocal change can be observed. So for right ventricular hypertrophy, R wave height would be more than 98% of the um, in lead V1 for the uh, normal uh, amplitude of a R wave. Uh, from that the previous table, we can calculate this, uh, how much percentage of the amplitude is uh, of the normal value. Then S wave in V6, similarly more than 98%. T wave abnormality. Um, example is upright in uh, childhood. Causes a pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, tetralogy of phylum. This is an example of right ventricular hypertrophy. Here the arrow shows the tall R wave in V1 and uh, it is more than 98 percent. Uh, this, is, this is your container old boy with pulmonary hypertension. Light axis deviation, it can be calculated from here. Um, then tall R wave in V1 and deep S wave in V6. Left ventricular hypertrophy, R wave height uh, similarly uh, more than 98 percentile for age in the V6 and S wave in 98 percentile for age in uh, uh, for the age in the V1. So it is the reverse of the uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. Lateral pattern R wave progression in the newborn no large wave R waves and small S waves in the right precordial leads. Left axis deviation will be there. Causes are aortic stenosis, coarctation, ventricular septal defect, fat inductus arteriosus. Unrepaired, this is an example of an unrepaired coarctation patient with a deep S wave in V1 and tall R wave. It's 98 percent. So it's an um, example of a left ventricle hypertrophy. Other criteria for ventricular hypertrophies for right ventricular hypertrophy, a QR complex or an RSR dash pattern in lead B1, upper upright T wave in the right precordial leads between age seven days to seven years. Market right axis deviation in association with right axial enlargement. Complete reversal of the adult precordial pattern of R and S waves. For left ventricle, uh, deep Q wave in the left precordial leads, typical adult changes of lateral ST segment depression and Q wave inversion. RVH in a transposition of great vessels after mustard operation. Here we can see that a tall R wave in V1 and deep S wave in V6. And uh, now the QT interval causes prolonged uh, QTC interval are hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypothermia drug treatment, cerebral injury, and congenital long QT syndrome as for example, Roman Ward syndrome. This prolonged QT interval as shown here uh, with arrow, this is the interval of two uh, QRS complex. It is more than half of the RR interval. Causes uh, of short QR interval, 
QTC interval is hypercalcemia, digitalis effect, congenital short QT syndrome, as for example, genetically inherited uh, channelopathies. Other associated features of the QT abnormality includes notching of the Q web, abnormal Q webs, relative bradycardia for age, Q web alternance. These children may be at risk of ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. Here is an example of uh, prolonged uh, QT interval with alternance of Q web. This uh, previous uh, T wave is upright. Here it is uh, negative and it's again upright, again negative. This Q wave alternates with long QT interval. Abnormal Q waves. Q waves in other the, uh, than leads 2, 3, AB8, V5, and V6 are rare and usually associated with disease. That is, uh, in these uh, five leads, normally QFs are present in uh, um, children. QFs are abnormal if appear in the right precordial leads, as for example in V1, that is severe RVH, are absent in the left precordial leads, as for example, left bundle branch block, are abnormally deep ventricular hypertrophy of the volume overlook type are abnormally deep and wide, as for example, anomalous left coronary artery, or myocardial infarction, or fibrosis secondary to Kawasaki syndrome. Pathological ST segment changes, commonly associated with Q web changes. Uh, this occurs in pericarditis, myocardial ischemia or infarction, severe ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular strain pattern, Digital is effect. Abnormal tears may be tall, peaked tears, occurs in hyperkalemia, left ventricular hypertrophy volume overload, benign early repolarization. This is a normal, um, considered to be normal. Flat tear seen in normal newborns, hypothyroidism hypokalemia, digitalis, pericarditis, myocarditis, myocardial ischemia. Large, deep, inverted tubes are seen with raised intracranial pressure, as for example, intracranial hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury. U-waves, most common causes include hypokalemia, normal finding in slower heart rate, that is sinus bradycardia. It, this is the uh, Q wave after Q wave is clearly visible here in a very patient. Characteristic is the pattern for particular conditions, as for example, pericarditis. Subepicardial myocardial damage causes the time dependent changes in ECG. Initially, PR segment depression, widespread concave ST segment elevation. Later, T segment returns to normal within one to three weeks of onset. Flattening of T waves and T wave inversion with isoelectric ST segment after two to four weeks of onset. This is an example of uh, acute pericarditis. Here, the uh, ST segment elevation with concavity upwards and ST depression with uh, convexity upwards in uh, AVR and widespread in many of the leads, especially the left-oriented and inferior leads, these are uh, clearly visible. In myocarditis, ECG findings of rheumatic or viral myocarditis are non-specific and include AV conduction disturbance, prolonged PR interval to complete AV dissociation may occur, Low QRS voltage, the five millimeter or less in the all limb limbs. Decreased Q wave amplitude, QT prolongation, HK arrhythmias, like supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia, pseudo infarction pattern 
with deep Q waves or poor R wave progression in precordial leads. Myocardial infarction or ischemia, same changes as that of adult myocardial infarction or ischemia. In infarction, uh, ST elevation in contiguous leads and reciprocal ST depression elsewhere. And in ischemia, horizontal ST depression. A wide variety, there is full range of dysrhythmia may occur in a pediatric patient. This from premature contraction that is atrial and ventricular. Tachyarrhythmias, the supraventricular tachycardia, like sinus tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, this paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, junctional tachycardia, ventricular, the ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Bradyarrhythmias, sinus bradycardia, junctional or nodal bradycardia, conduction abnormalities uh, uh, like first degree atrioventricular block, second degree atrioventricular mobis type 1, when Quebec or type 2, third degree AV block. All this may happen in a child. Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Jamil, for your brilliant presentation. It was a brief. Uh, Firod, uh, Professor Shakil Ahmed, when pediatric see Professor Dhaka Medical, he has joined. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Vadu, thank you very much for uh, giving me the here the opportunity to join here. So, uh, professor Shakil is a professor of pediatrics in Dhaka Middle College. Uh, I was just a little bit late to contact him. Anyway, uh, uh, Jamil Bhai, can I ask uh, you a simple question? Sure. Uh, in adults, we consider that sinus tachycardia is when it's the rate is sinus and repeat rate rhythm is sinus and rate is more than hundred. And how can you determine this sinus tachycardia in a particular age group? in children or any of the panelists in the pediatric cardiologist they are uh, uh, let me say something uh, uh, last week we discussed about this um, rate or uh, it um, highest in the neonates and gradually it comes down and becomes almost uh, adult heart rate after six years after six to ten years it becomes uh, heart rate becomes almost adult -like. So we have to keep that chart in our head and in what age group, what is the range. It's very difficult to memorize. Um, but uh, probably pediatrician always practice and they can recollect very easily. We don't practice, so, so we need that chart uh, nearby. Now, my point is, how are we going to make the diagnosis of sinus tachycardia in these patients? Mane, what should be our uh, writing pattern? in reporting the ECG. Nahruma or anyone, can you answer it? Sir, I think uh, in the previous session, uh, Dr. Rezwan Arima uh, uh, mentioned a Z-score of calculator that uh, we have. Acha. We can use that, things. Okay, can you plus, two, plus two Z-score, that will be sinus tachycardia. If P is present and more than plus two, then bradycardia. Ah. Yeah, I forgot it. Yes, you have told. The general email was actually. Yeah, the scoring system. But uh, can you send that scoring system uh, uh, to the uh, to uh, review so that we can have that all of the participants can have that score. Uh, it's, have a it's, it's in the net, sir. Oh. The actually, G, uh, G score is in the net. Ah. Anyone can use it. Google, sir. You just Google, Google and yeah, PDF, page Z score like that. Z score. In yes, Apple's also uh, another parameter Z, and in Google, just a Z score calculator of heart rates. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean to just um, uh, Rima or Nahruma to Also, uh, uh, what? 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 Uh, what
গান তো এখন শোনা যাবে না আচ্ছা Sir, the, for arrhythmia, uh, the same way we, uh, uh, the adult, the way uh, you uh, diagnose an arrhythmia is like uh, normal upright P-wave axis is normal, upright P-wave will lead to, and there will be P-wave uh, before QRS complex. And the rate, uh, last, uh, last session I have said that the maximum sinus rate a person can Uh, we would be to 220 minus uh, age in years that is a simple thing you can do and uh, whenever there is an upright p wave in, uh, before every qrs complex and uh, the p wave axis is normal this is sinus arrhythmia up to uh, 220 for a new net and uh, but sometimes like 150 can be a uh, uh, abnormal uh, arrhythmia like uh, uh, in new net and early infancy we encounter different kinds of arrhythmia like junctional ectopic tachycardia uh, perm, uh, pjrt and atrial ectopic tachycardia multifocal atrial tachycardia and this rate may be uh, lower than normal like uh, that that uh, um, 150 to 200 to 220 can be an arrhythmia but in that case uh, like junctional ectopic tachycardia there will be a dissociation and PGRT, there will be inverted P wave in lead to 3 AVF. And we know actual tachycardia, there will be long RP tachycardia, short RP tachycardia. That way, I mean, the, uh, uh, the P wave uh, ex, uh, axis will be changed in uh, PGRT patient or actual ectopic tachycardia. There will be abnormal P wave or P wave morphology should be changed. The same way the adult diagnosed as a uh, tachycardia, we diagnose in the same way. So um, I just want to add with uh, Dr. Tamils that we are getting a lot of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So nowadays we, we are getting, whenever we, we get a child with a cardiomyopathy, we used to do an ECG to check whether there is some form of uh, tachycardia, in, whether this is, this is a kind of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy or not especially uh, permanent junction and reciprocating tachycardia that we know as uh, PJRT. So like 150 to 200 uh, rate would be enough to form this because these are incessant tachycardia and they, they, they uh, causes um, uh, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. We had encountered a lot of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy cases nowadays. And even, uh, in, even fetus also, um, comes to us at 30 to 35 weeks, just 30, uh, around 28 to 30 weeks gestation with uh, high drops with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy and high drops. So that also we need to uh, terminate uh, in utero. For that, uh, we have some other protocols. And in UNAT also, uh, UNAT are at two months of age, sometimes some children um, after myocarditis came with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So it's difficult to understand whether this myocarditis leads to uh, cardiomyopathy or there is some form of uh, tachycardia is also there. So um, these I just want to um, add. 
uh, and the question is, uh, we get a lot of patients, the children particularly, with uh, diarrhea. And with diarrhea, what sort of arrhythmia do we usually get? And uh, should we be concerned too much about that? Uh, with diarrhea... We don't uh, see those. That, that will be related no, no. with the hypo, uh, electrolyte yeah. imbalance. imbalance yeah. Uh, that's what I was asking. And uh, uh, do you get that much of an arrhythmia? With In, the diarrhea. Are they, are they more prone to develop hypokalemia more than the adults, the young children? Yes. Some idea because our audience will be uh, in the peripheries and everywhere. Sometimes they have to give some uh, judicious answer uh, to that particular problem. So your discussion will be very helpful for them. Uh, with dehydration, diarrhea with dehydration, sometimes we find uh, sinus arrhythmia. But with uh, hypokalemia, uh, uh, not much of arrhythmia, but that there, there would be some uh, the, the ECG change with hypokalemia or hypernatremia. The same ECG change that is happening with adult. No, I, I haven't encountered any uh, arrhythmia other than sinus arrhythmia with dehydration and diarrhea. That means you don't get that much of ventricular arrhythmia in these patients. I mean, there is no rhythm disturbance. There may be some uh, STT. I mean, there, there may be some changes because of electrolyte imbalance, but we don't routinely do ECG in a diarrhea patient unless there is a uh, rhythm disturbance or any kind of deviation of the heart rate from normal range to, uh, I mean, above the normal range or below the normal range. Other, un, otherwise, we, we don't do, routinely do uh, ECG in a diarrhea patient. That uh, we do not in a diarrhea patient, in post-operative patients, sometimes in emergency situation where ABG machine is not working, that ECG helps. There any tall P wave, QRS, or on, on that helps us, electrolyte imbalance. Uh, today, one thing I want to draw everyone's attention can I add a little bit here? Takil Bay, please. Uh, to add with the Rezwana Rima, diarrhea, the problem of diarrhea is a lot of water and electrolytes. I've got a request to all doctors who are listening to me to go for an ECG, go for replacement of fluid. That is the primary thing. You want to do an ECG? I think there is no literature so far as I can recall. There can be research on other things. So for that perspective, those who are interested in research, they can go for an ECG. Right. But Do those you know the periphery, yeah. go for water and electrolyte replacement fast in any dehydration before going to do an ECG. Thank you very much. Uh, why I was saying actually, now nowadays, use of the well, pulse oximeter has become very widespread. So in the pulse oximeter, we are getting the level of abnormal beats and everything, and also seeing the pulse wave. That actually is drawing attention to many of the parents and also the doctors. Nowadays, it, has, it was not before, but nowadays it has become widespread. And you can rest assured, this pulse oximeter use will be continued even after the COVID era. So I think our uh, pediatric cardiologist will be getting more call for that. <laughs> yes, sometimes some worried patient came to us with the pulse oximeter that said, that showed that the, the baby's heart rate is 120. So we have to explain that this is within normal limit. We have to do the G score and say that, okay, this is normal for that child. Because of, uh, sorry, you are correct. Now this era, a lot of patients come to our uh, OPD uh, that uh, they, they uh, check the pulse oximeter and they found the heart rate is 120. So they get very worried and uh, come to us. Uh, I'll be asking another question that's my, out of my curiosity. Uh, we have to use different sort of antibiotics and other things in case of children. And does that lead to any problem, Shakil Bhai, in your experience? Any cardiac problem whatsoever? Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, we use different sort of a, a antibiotic. And nowadays, antibiotic is so widespread. Does that lead to any particular problem in case of children regarding the cardiac function and rhythm? Yeah. 
exactly we have you the we haven't found encountered anything in the case reports and other things from bangladesh on this issue but there are a couple of case reports from outside bangladesh i seen the children have allergic problems malaria as it is use of the anti malarial in bangladesh has been and limited to very few areas of bangladesh only in the hilltop area so currently we are not encountering those things as well actually sir we are very reluctant to do an ecg for a child that is the problem whenever uh, whenever possible we are doing an eco i mean so that's why ecg is under uh, estimated or so we don't know the actually what are the ecg changes with any antibiotics or any uh, drugs i hope my question will be encouraging you to do that and we want to have uh, some insight regarding that we have found a patient of infective endocarditis that we are giving a vancomycin sir uh, was causing uh, arrhythmia junctional i think so for i remember sir that uh, we have to stop that vancomycin sir uh, one thing i have learned from rafiq sir that whenever you get a child or anyone uh, with a tachycardia if the rate is too much fixed at one point you should check out the whether it is sinus or not most likely it's not sinus because sir have taught us and he, he now it's been ingrained in our mind sinus tachycardia will vary because of the autonomic tone it will not be fixed at a 130 per minute continuously it will be 130 35 140 something like that but if you get a child as rajan was saying we are getting a lot of Uh, tachycardiomyopathies i think this is very much under diagnosed in this country because i have some experience with this type of patient and i have sent those to pediatric cardiologist that tachycardiomyopathy uh, in the children young children around 6 year old 5 year old 10 year old uh, and i think this is very much under diagnosed in this country can i add uh, one point uh, sinus tachycardia uh, i get many patients but uh, i tell them count their heart rate uh, pulse during rest and during sleep and i have to uh, i sometimes i exclude heterotoxicosis uh, uh, stress anxiety whether exam is there or not i, I exclude these things sir do you want to make a comment sir rohit sir sir unmute sir unmute sir sir are you have to unmute can you hear me now yes yeah. sir yeah so uh, one of the important thing is the pjrt you remember in adult we rarely see paroxysmal junctional tachycardia is uh, is more common in ad- uh, children but also we have to remember what we call pjrt is it really true pjrt or a, some form of even no reentry or incessant other tachycardia because um the patients that we see are the adult ones but lot of these patients with uh, concealed accessory pathway even no reentry can have will have this as a child i mean youngest patient that i have done ablation for w period is a one year old child and the patient had incessant tachycardia that we had we are forced to we had a choice between doing um giving amiodarone with the side effects versus um ablation and we did ablation and it worked fine sir actually what rezona rima added that is a uh, take into cardiomyopathy possibly that is a combination of the take cardiomyopathy and the take cardia is not uncommon that is commoner in children than the adult so the question is sir what are the common arrhythmias that are responsible for the take into cardiomyopathy in this group it is difficult to prove which one is the primary that is the tachycardia but if the tachycardia is the uh, cause then what are the common elements she expected that the uh, pjrt is one of the common then the other uh, causes sir no i mean when we say pjrt basically because we cannot see p wave so in adults you can see what we call true junctional tachycardia that means the av node has become it has become faster it's not a reentrant arrhythmia but then again 
you can have a significant number, which actually is avinodal variant and tachycardia, um, or atrioventricular variant using council pathway. And even though we, you, it is more common to see a, a tachycardia cardiomyopathy in children, I have seen adults with tachycardia cardiomyopathy. They have no symptom at all with heart rate of 130, 140, but I think these patients get used to it. So etiology in the spectrum, we should consider all the etiologies uh, except flutter, atrial flutter in, in children also. I found some uh, ju junctional ectopic tachycardia with cardiomyopathy, some multifocal atrial tachycardia with cardiomyopathy, and uh, atrial tachycardia with uh, tachy uh, tachycardiomyopathy. So I have a spectrum of eight to 10 patients. I can present if uh, the if uh, I permit if you permit then subsequent any session I have the yes, ECGs yes. also okay. and Atta, it's very interesting. What we should do next week because we are doing pediatric uh, ECGs. Why don't you, uh, Dr. Rizwana, to present um, the cases? It will be very interesting. Uh, a continuation of the uh, lecture series. Rima, can you present it next Saturday? Yes, sir. I, I will try. Yes, sir. No, we'll be Hopefully. Happy. Actually, next Saturday was a schedule for Rofix, sir. But I think see, if you are ready, then we can uh, change the date. That is the Rofix will present later on, and you are welcome for the next Saturday. Are you ready? Yes, sir. One half I can present, and the other half, sir, can present. I mean. Nahruba, can we add something more? Uh, also, the other pediatric college. If you want to add something, we'll be really, really grateful, and we'll be enjoying that. We'll be looking forward to that. There, uh, there are few tips for the uh, adult cardiologist and pediatrician, sir, and adult, uh, mostly adult cardiologist, sir. Um, like ECO, we also see the situs axis, and that Atahari, sir, on that day is telling how do we uh, uh, come to conclusive uh, diagnosis by seeing an ECG, because we know the ECG can tell about the chamber, dimension, hypertrophy, all this, but in uh, pediatrics, uh, it is very important. Sometimes uh, we have to decide by ECG situs, actual situs is present or not, ventricular levocardia is present or not. And also we have to uh, see that is the patient is uh, like ASD, VASD operable or not, or by classifying the type of the ASD or VASD, we can easily do on that case, or sometimes by seeing the uh, loop that, uh, clockwise loop and counterclockwise loop. That also we see in the ECG and we, uh, with the help of the ECG, we can see this. Uh, and Nahruma, can you, uh, with case, uh, a little bit, a few cases, can you present some of those? So then Rajwana Rima and uh, you, you two, uh, will be, will be having very good session. Okay, sir. Uh, that will be help, sir, because very uh, uh, complex congenital heart disease that we can easily diagnose by the ECG. By uh, tricuspid atresia, we can see right axis deviation, with, uh, sorry, left axis deviation with... Don't diagnose now. Keep it secret. We'll, okay, be, we'll be looking for that. <laughs> but, uh, then, then, sir, next Saturday, that is speaker will be Rezona Rima and Naharuma. Yes, that'll be good. Achha, Hassan Mula, Firoz, Hassan Mula, you can do it. Sir, we can... Uh, there are two pediatric cardiologists from Nepal, sir. Monish and yeah. Urmila. Ah, yes. Manish and Urmila, please open your video, please. Manish and Urmila. Ah, yes. They are here. Welcome. Uh, good evening. I see uh, to participate here today's program like uh, last time also. Yeah, today there is very good uh, discussion about a different kind of disease and it's showing the abnormality of the ECG is very, very nice. And it's, the, it's very challenging to do ECG in the small is uh, 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 mostly, for example, in very uncooperative child, if there is a, mostly they have some anxiety component when they are separate from the parents like that. In such cases also, we most of the time we can get the artifact also. But even though that the ECG is very, very important, sometimes after doing echo also, we cannot have the ECG get done. So sometimes 
after doing the echo, sometimes if we can get the abnormality in the ECG, sometimes it may change our echo diagnosis also, or there may be something we have to go on searching if there is any uh, misdiagnosis or some is lacking. So though it's challenging, and most of the technician also, they are not willing to do uh, uh, ECG in a small case due to the, some technical problem. They are very uncooperative like that. But even that, it is very, very helpful and it can support our diagnosis very properly. So it should be give many, many focus on the ECG besides the directly go on the doing the echocardiography. So, so this type of webinar for this all uh, uh, pediatrician as well as pediatric cardiologists so are very important because we are not seeing much of the pediatric ECG regularly like the other investigations. So it's very, very important and it's very nice to have this type of the this program. So thank you very much. Urmila, do you do the ECG in all the cases or the, as, as because the ECO is the most uh, useful test for the diagnosis. All the pediatric patients are done ECO, but not all the patients have got the ECG. Do you do? That is the ECG and ECO, both the cases. That is all the cases. Uh, or you do the only ECO? In the principle, that uh, basic investigation after the history is the ECG and chest X-ray. Then we have to go for the echocardiography. But due to the technical problem and small kids, very conduction disturbances or tachycardia or very bradycardia, which are which cannot be explained by the other uh, methods. So at that time, however, it is very difficult. Then we have we try to to get the ECG. Manish, unmute, please, Manish. Uh, unmute. Please, please, please unmute yourself. Manish, we cannot hear you. Can you unmute, please? Uh, good evening. Yeah, most of the things has already been uh, said that, that that's everywhere is true that it's really difficult to do ECG in each and every cases. That's very true because uh, we have to sedate them uh, because they are very uncooperative. So uh, as the Dr. Urmila and other pediatric cardiologists mentioned that only in needed cases, only in where the ECG is really helpful, uh, we are doing in those cases. All cases we are not doing, but it's always better to have ECG and X-ray first before echo. But uh, we are going opposite because it's uh, in day-to-day -day practice is really difficult in small children actually. Uh, one of the question from the audience is, what are the indication that where we have to do the ECG with all the problems? Uh, can anyone answer that? Yeah, it's like uh, the most important indication is the arrhythmia. That that is the one part where we cannot diagnose by echo. That's the most important uh, indication. Apart from this, yeah, as uh, Nahurum, uh, Dr. Nahurum has mentioned that we can uh, diagnose the complex congenital heart disease by ECG, but eventually we have to do echo. Uh, we can suspect uh, congenital heart disease by ECG, that's true, but we have to do echo. That's, but in arrhythmia, we cannot diagnose by echo. So arrhythmia is the most important indication in my opinion. Apart from those, yeah, it's helpful in other cases also. Before surgery, sir, before surgery, we used to do uh, congenital heart surgery. Before any congenital heart surgery, we used to check the ECG whether there is any uh, the sinus rhythm. And sometimes the heart rate is in the lower range. So we sometimes we fail to pick up the heart block, like two is to one heart block. So uh, so routinely before uh, in uh, cardiac surgery, uh, we used to do EC ECGs. That is uh, one more. Uh, also, before any intervention, cardiac uh, intervention, yeah, exactly. And uh, those we who are uh, working in our uh, like specialized hospital, every patient we do who came to in uh, OPD uh, because all of the patients have have form of syncope, feeling unwellness or occasional palpitation, history of um, family history of congenital heart disease and uh, restlessness. All these symptoms we uh, we do a routine ECG. We don't do the routine eco for all patients, but we do a routine ECG, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Can I make a comment? I think okay. what's happening, I mean, it was true for every country that pediatric cardiology was mainly focused on congenital heart disease, but not the, not the other part. It was always perceived that a pediatric cardiologist would be congenital. But you know, children can have MI, children can have arrhythmia. I mean, that's something that we are expanding, that I think as time passes by, 
will have more and more patients, the family is more conscious. I mean, if somebody has palpitation as a child, people will most of the time will ignore it. Well, I, nothing, it's just a palpitation, we're running around. So I think uh, more and more we'll see other uh, problems that will require that we do ECGs. Can I ask you a, a question about pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh and Nepal? Uh, whoever, uh, all of you who become pediatric, did you train in pediatrics first and then become cardiologist or you trained as adult cardiologist became pediatric cardiologist? <laughs> My subject is pediatrician, sir. I am a pediatrician. Then I have do fellowship one year course and uh, in pediatric cardiology, sir. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because I think this is the uh, one of the flaw. Uh, it's not a flaw in the way it happened in Bangladesh that adult cardiologists are not trained in medicine, and I think that's the gap. Because then, you, but I think any subject specialty should be. Uh, somebody should be pediatrician first and then pediatric cardiologist. Likewise, a surgeon, cardiac surgeon, should be general surgeon first, and then you become cardiac surgeon because then you, you, you see the patient as a whole. Here in the United States, we, I can take care of diabetes because I'm trained in internal medicine first, and I cannot become a cardiologist unless I am board certified in internal medicine, and which is, I think, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that, that you came from pediatrics and you did cardiology. That makes it complete because then you look at the patient as a total patient, not just looking at the heart. Very, I'm very happy to hear that. Before going to next session, I want to hear uh, one thing from the Navin Sheikh. Navin Sheikh. Well, uh, actually, I am in the Department of Adult Cardiology, but I have completed my fellowship from NUA Singapore and Escort Delhi in Pediatric Cardiology. Now I'm uh, <laughs> working in Adult Cardiology. Uh, what I think that we have to remember that what are the common variations in rhythm, which may be normal in children, like sinus arrhythmia or short sinus pauses, which uh, Dr. Z uh, Jamil Bhai has already mentioned, fast degree block. Another thing is sometimes we get notched P wave in 25% pediatric patient in lead to, that is normal for, uh, for, for those kids. And also like Winke back, uh, then uh, fast degree AV block, it can be, a normal variant in 10 percent of the kids these things we have to uh, remember like junctional rhythm or uh, supraventricular or ventricular ex extra systoles usually they disappear during exercise and another thing is already dr uh, naruma already mentioned that by ecg we can assess actually ecg always should be interpreted why well, i think i think that along with clinical and uh, radiological data then we can understand the what hemodynamics changes occurring in particular disease. Uh, we can we can assess the severity of the disease in in case of the, uh, like a stenotic lesion, aortic stenosis, or pulmonary stenosis. And in case of operable and inoperable cases, if operable, then there will be a shunt anomaly. In case of shunt anomaly, pre caspid or post recaption, there will be left sided precordial forces will be. Uh, uh, um, higher higher than and there will be q waves present on the left sided picardial leaves it means that there is increased pulmonary blood flow patient has not developed pulmonary vascular obstructive disease, obstructive disease. but if there will be diminished q waves on the left sided uh, leaves and the right uh, there will be rv dominance tall peak in that case also we have to check the saturation also if saturation less than 90 we can get information that the patient is inoperable it is the very easy easiest way and another thing uh, I want to add that in case of uh, um, AV nodal block, it can occur as a familial or non-familial. Some family members, uh, we have seen that ASD with uh, first degree heart block, but another with intact uh, septum, but PR prolongation. So we have to keep in mind that what are the normal variation in the rhythm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I make a comment? Sir. Yes, sir. I think Dr. Navin made a very, very important point that we should all remember. When we report ECG, we always, I don't see the patient, I say clinical correlation is needed. But she said that you cannot just look at an ECG, you have to think of the patient. I mean, to, to get more, so please remember in, my, in our audience for the junior doctors that ECG by itself is just a test. You have to correlate with the patient's uh, clinical scenario. Uh, and that's very, very important. 
Thank you. Like early repolarization, sometimes I do, we get that early repolarization, just like pericarditis, right? Am I right, Jamil Bhai? Yes. That, um, I, I think agree. point elevation like this, something like this, that is normal. No, but uh, we have to uh, understand which we which finding we will get in pericardial effusion. It is only repolarized by repolarization. It's normal. Also, uh, uh, the, is, uh, the uh, there, poor progression of the R wave like this. So many things we get. No, there is a, as because uh, it represents the dominance of the LV function. And another is uh, sinus arrhythmia. I get so many so many ECG when I uh, when I do the report sinus arrhythmia. The sinus arrhythmia, we have to understand that during inspiration, vagal tone is decreases. Uh, also in obesity, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, we can get this sinus arrhythmia. It is, though it is common between three to 30 years of age, but it's most common in children. And another thing Dr. Naharuma has mentioned very nicely that ASD, I, I wanted to say about it, that ASD, we can uh, divide it into two, like clockwise loop or counterclockwise loop. In, a clockwise loop will be present in HD secundum. And in sinus venosus HD, there will be clockwise loop, but P wave will, will be inverted in, I think, lead uh, three. Now, uh, yeah. One and V. And in counter, uh, counter clockwise loop, like Austrian primum HD, uh, and, and another cause I don't remember. Uh, this way, HD can be divided. And VSD Naruto will show us this ECG in the next class. And so VSD VSD can for be another seven days. Now we can move, I think, to the, our next session. Hello, uh, what if I wanted to say something? Sure. going to next session, what is it? Hassan Murad, take a hat to chill over there to question. Good to chai. Hassan Murad, are you with us? Are you indeed? Do you want to ask any question? Hassan Murad. Oh, he is not here, sir. That's all right. The, we, we should start. We are waiting for Rafik sir session. So, Naharuma, Rima, next Saturday, please. This is the invitation. Yeah, inshallah, sir. Inshallah, sir. including our Shakil Bhai, Urmila. Amin Sheikh, you are always welcome. Shakil Bhai, always welcome. And Manish and Urmila. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm I, sorry, I'm not a pediatrician. I, I did two months of pediatrics and I loved it <coughs> um, uh, as an intern. Um, but I think there is a lot of overlap uh, in cardiology. And one of the fields that we need to develop in Bangladesh is uh, specialist in adult congenital heart disease. That, that means when the pediatricians uh, see the heart disease patients, once they become adult, um, they should be moved to the adult. So uh, that's a spectrum. That thing. So I'm going to start with one ECG. I have nothing to do with this one. And I have uh, given some choices here. And then uh, we'll discuss this ECG. Uh, this is a 79-year-old male uh, with history of cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction around 25%. And I have put the heart rate in the bottom is 115 beats per minute. Let me start the poll. Re, uh, remove. remove or, uh, yes. Rose, ask the person to answer anyone, no problem. Uh, so, the answer, 64% said it is atrial fibrillation in the right bundle branch. Okay, so I'm going to leave it. Uh, I, want to, I want to see that, uh, please keep that number. Uh, I would like our panelists. So the, the question would be, all are valid choices. Otherwise, I would not have put those choices. The question is, what is the most reasonable choice? Um, I want our panelists to comment on this ECG. 
this is a very interesting ecg sir the rhythm is clearly irregularly irregular and we cannot see the p wave okay the p that is the clean cut p waves are not visible and the rhythm is uh, clearly so i am uh, my first choice is atrial fibrillation number 3 is clearly out that okay. is number 3 is clearly out then ventricular tachycardia uh, i think this is also uh, we can uh, clearly out this uh, possibilities then the number 1 uh, and 2 athar bhai look at you wa and between these two i hmm. i'll say the atrial fibrillation sir as because the, there is no p wave and it is irregular irregular anybody else ऑडिबल sir uh, i'll uh, the rhythm is irregularly irregular but the if i look at the uh, lead v1 yes. the baseline that looks like the flutter li- flutter like wave okay. so uh, for that reason my first uh, differential diagnosis will be atrial flutter with variable con- uh, variable conduction okay yeah so i mean those are all possibilities so uh, anybody unless anybody else is there i'll ask jamie yeah. Uh, sir uh, sir i want to add one point another observation of me in the rhythm is still there is sort of group beating two beats and a gap then another two beats another uh, and a gap and a two, two beats exactly exactly brings the choice of atrial flutter with variable block or sinus rhythm with atrial premature this is okay. unlikely of atrial fibrillation okay sure sir sir to zaman sir everything uh, already discussed one one point i want to notice here there is the rbb but the axis is the left axis deviation yes that's interesting finding yes sir so we'll keep that finding in the pocket and we'll de- come to the discussion jamil any comment sir, sir i uh, noticed what firoz mentioned i want to go on that point only that uh, uh, to me it seems uh, is um, uh, is a bijimini type atrial tachycardia okay uh, yeah one beat followed by another um, yeah, and there is a pause yeah. and uh, there is tachycardia so the pause is uh, little narrower yeah so i go for the third choice right okay so i mean i'm going to go and by system i think all are valid valid choices the problem with atrial fibrillation you see there is a pattern huh. short interval long interval short interval long interval so it is not irregularly irregular so i think even though suddenly i look at it looks irregular but it's not irregularly irregular so i think atrial fibrillation is probably out now i can have atrial flutter with variable conduction as it was mentioned maybe this is a flutter wave if you can see my pointer and this is another flutter wave this is another flutter wave and so and so forth and of course sinus rhythm or an ectopic atrial rhythm with premature beat but there is no p wave now even though this looks suddenly looks narrow but it is actually wide qrs 160 millisecond and then that is left axis deviation there is an important point so i have a now i am stuck with is it ventricular tachycardia or is it because one of the problem with right bundle it should have right axis deviation it's not it read one i don't see terminal so wave but it is still can be right bundle so let's look at this few things so my my problem now is is it a supraventricular rhythm whatever it is atrial flutter sinus rhythm or ectopic or ventricular tachycardia so i'm going to look at few points to make my case so is there precordial concordance that means in limb leads in chest lead are all of them looking up without any rs pattern in this case the answer is no because in v6 there is rs pattern so there is no precordial concordance so that goes out 
My next choice is, is the onset of R wave to the deepest point of S wave, is it more than 100 millisecond in any precordial lead? I have taken this complex and have expanded it. And you can see that is 120 millisecond. So that fulfills criteria for VT. But remember all these criteria, no, none of them are 100% correct, but that's a possibility. So next look, so I'm going to take it a yes and maybe VT. VT. But let's look at, is that a V dissociation? So I'm going to bring that ECG up again. It is very difficult to find a V dissociation unless I'm very imaginative. And maybe this is a P wave, which is absent here, but that's a little bit of stretching the imagination quite a bit. But I cannot use this point. Second, next I'm going to look at, is there morphology criteria for VT in V1 and V6? And these are the morphology criteria that is, if it is right bundle type, this pattern, either monophysic R or QR or RS pattern in V1 and RS less than one in V6 suggest VT. And I'm going to superimpose. This is right bundle type. And if you look at lead V1, it's a QR pattern, which fulfills this criteria of VT. So this patient actually had a VT and I have confirmed it because patient had a defibrillator. And when I do the intracardiac on the same day, I could see the AV dissociation. So this is an unusual case. Now the question is, why is it irregular? That is the problem. So morphology criteria fulfilled, VT. This one fulfills, I have two criteria fulfilled. And actually in other ECGs, I could see AV dissociation, two criteria. So this is ventricular tachycardia. Now let's look at it. Why is it irregular? So VT happens normally with a scar. And I have drawn a if you shaded area at the infarcted tissue and white area is where it can conduct electricity. And so in a scar, I can form a re-entry circuit and it produces a QRS complex as it comes out. And if it went back through the same circuit again, it will produce another QRS interval and another one at a regular interval. But what can happen that you can have a two entry point in the same scar. This time it was blocked. And second time it comes back through this shorter circuit, it will come earlier and produce this earlier complex. And then it goes back to the circuit, uses the another pathway, and then produces the second. And you can actually see VT with irregularity because there is two entry point in the short circuit. If the exit, sometimes you can see by Gemini with a different morphology QRS, that means the entry point is correct, but the exit are too different. And that is the explanation for this. So anybody, any other question on this? Rohit bhai, it is posterior fascicular VT neck. Well, the patient, it is, Fascicular VT is a possibility, right bundle, left, but or a scar near that area. Because fascicular VT will be a little narrower. This was 160 milliseconds. This is a little wider. And this patient has history of MI um, with scar VT. We studied this patient. Can it but be it WPW looks... with AF? Well, okay. okay. Yes. If it was AF with WPW, the, that the diagnostic criteria AF with WPW, irregular RR, irregular QRS width. In this patient, the RR is irregular, but the QRS width is not irregular. Anytime we find something with a white QRS tachycardia with irregular RR interval, if the QRS is width is irregular, that is WPW with, um, with uh, uh, with accessory pathway conduction during AFib. But this one is, is basically not WPW syndrome. But definitely that's a consideration because it looks like, here it looks like pre-excited B. But all the QRSs look similar. In WPW, Rafik Bhai, the, the, typically the antidromic conduction with presenting with uh, AFib 
and white QRS looking, um, usually the rate is very high, like exactly. 1,900. Yes, yes. This is a very slow beat. This is a very slow beat. This patient had VT as slow as 100 bits per minute. Uh, and this was the interesting case discussion. All right, so we'll go to another. I'm going to start with simple ECG uh, uh, and then move on. Sir. Yeah. Sir, if you don't. Sir, if you don't mind, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. So if this ECG is given to us, yes, yes. So commenting other than AFib or atrial flutter as a rational uh, rationality, can we comment VT other than uh, AFib or a flutter with variable oh, yes. conduction? The diagnosis is ventricular tachycardia. That is the diagnosis. So no question about it. So this is ECG. Um, we want some answers. And I hope this will be 100% correct. I think we, we need to remember, audience need to remember that during this discussion, we are not only going to show complex, difficult ECGs, we will also show simple things. Uh, and what do you think? Uh, um, 80% says, says it is atrial paced rhythm. Okay. And any disagreement with that? 10% uh, dual chamber pacemaker and 10% sinus rhythm with left atrial enlargement. Good. So uh, at least I'm ha happy that nobody said ventricular paste rhythm, that's fantastic. And then, of course, dual chamber paste rhythm will come to that, but majority say the atrial paste rhythm, we can see atrial pacing spike. I'm going to look at the rhythm strip in the bottom, atrial pacing spike, there is a P wave, there is QRS. There is a ventricular pacing spike. Uh, and so this is basically, it can be a dual chamber pacemaker, but I cannot comment on that. So this is actually um, atrial paste rhythm. Thank you. Next one. This is uh, actually a good distribution. <laughs> yes. All right. So I leave it to. Um... What do I? What do I? <laughs> uh, I always look at the lead one. The QRS complex in that end, it has a P wave. The three QRS complex all have P wave, so it's a sinus rhythm. But we have some. Uh, uh, big complexes, so there are some PVC as well. Now, the point is, is there left atrial enlargement? Because sinus rhythm, left at, uh, PVC, we are all getting that. For left atrial enlargement in V1, the negative comp uh, part is not that big. I'm not that convinced. It could be. Achha. But one thing that looks very uh, uh, prominent is that as a whole, the complex is very, very smallish. So, if somebody says sinus rhythm with low voltage PVC and some non specific T wave changes, I would rather go for that. And look at 3 and also FEF. There seems to be a smallish Q wave. This could be an old inferior MI as well. Because the uh, uh, if the voltage is quite all right, uh, one millivolticle to 10 millimeter. So this is low voltage ECD should draw our attention as well. Anybody else, any comment? 
Uh, I would like to go with the uh, uh, third choice, actual test. Yes, Please, B1. What is happening? Need B1. There is some spike before the. Yes, yes. There is one spike in the uh, uh, second third wave. No, there are a lot of spikes no, 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 no. in the uh, lead three. Okay, I'm going to move this ECG. This is what I have done. I have expanded V1. And this is this. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at the rhythm strip, so this makes a point. Modern ECG machines filtering is, is problem. Such. And also the because of the bipolar yes, sir. pacing, and also not only that bipolar pacing, most, most of the pacemakers have auto capture. So they, in the old days, we program pacemaker at 2.5 volt. They don't necessarily program at 2.5 volt. They program at a very low voltage, like 1 volt, 1.2 volt, a little bit above safety margin. So this, and if you see that this, I kept the report. This was a report confirmed by cardiologist, and that's fine. I mean, that is something that we will miss sometimes. But when we see some artifact, we should look back and to see if we can see it somewhere else. So yeah. it was basically an actual paste rhythm um, and PVC with the low voltage EC. Thank you. Vigbhai, I have done this trick with the uh, calibration 25 millimeter speed. Um, I go 50 and then make a SVT looking like VT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this one? Refer to me polling tie, act to pore dio. B6 is a bit of 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 a Continue until um, what time? 25, sir. We have got 35 minutes more. Okay. So, so this time. Swagger, come on to get about yourself with Okay. Okay. Happy so, way. Jamil, comment on ah. this. Again, sir, it's still paste through them. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is great. I mean, this is, I'm glad that everybody, majority of, uh, got it. Well, how many percent people answer this, uh, answering uh, these questions? I said, I didn't notice the number, total number, but... Again, I would like to encourage the audience, please do answer. I yes. mean, first of all, we can answer in two different ways. We can answer by thinking about something. We can also, sometimes we do random choice. Even if you do random choice without thinking, then you commit yourself and then when we discuss the answer, that will become a learning uh, uh, process. So please Bidur, do answer. Bidur, let me relaunch the program. Don't, okay. don't do it yourself. I, I can do it. No. Again, I have expanded the ECG. You can see lead V1. Yes. You can see the spike. This is a little bit better than the other one. And yes. once we have pacing complex, we should not comment of left atrial enlargement or not, because that becomes kind of mute. Uh, because where the, we don't know where the lead is. So this, this is the actual pace rhythm. Um, I think I, today I have just... Vic, I have a clinical case. 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 Let me go and... So I'll skip through this. I'll do one more. And then you do this. I'll do two. So this one. This is what I'm doing now. Hey, 
pacing spike before the p wave so basically it's a bit choice between every sequential pace rhythm with hysteresis every sequential pace rhythm. both are correct but i think more correct is such hysteresis because if you see the pr interval is long right sir and suddenly if you look at it you may think this pacemaker is malfunctioning what this pacemaker is doing i'm going to look i'm going to show you something the same patient what i did i got the intracardiac uh, from the pacemaker if you see this it keep prolonging the interval to see if there is intrinsic conduction and after a certain bit it goes back to the short av delay and then it keeps it doing it again and again the purpose is to save battery life and allow av conduction but this feature should not be turned on if patient is pacing all the time it is only good for patient who have first degree av block with a pacemaker one more and i am done here this Please carefully look at the rhythm strip in the bottom. And what you are looking for for the audience is is it pacing in the atrium is it pacing in the ventricle is it capturing the atrium is it capturing the ventricle is it sensing intrinsic p wave or it is not and that's what we are looking for I'm looking at your uh, answers Profik bhai, one, two, three, four. The look at V five and then answer. No, no, no. Come, uh, Afi, let the audience answer and then you will. Hmm. So the audience called for C, sir. Fifty-four percent. Failure of atrial. Maybe sequential pace rhythm, failure of atrial pacing and sensing. Okay, Afi, now your comment. Oh, so no, that's a, that's a tough one because the way you phrased it is that. failure of atrial pacing and sensing but we are seeing that there is atrial pace ventricular pace atrial pace ventricular pace atrial sense ventricular pace but this is little odd and then ventricular pace atrial activity and then without pace and then so it makes sense that this is probably both sensing and pacing failure of the atrial lead so this is what i have done sir i'm going to echo yeah follow uh in the rhythm strip what we find the initially both atrial ventricular pacing now look at the fourth one the there is intrinsic qs complex coming on when the ventricular pacing just started and thereafter the ventricular pacing is not there but the atrial spike is there and it's not actually sensing the atrial beat that's already present it's right. sensing the ventricular beat it's not producing any ventricular pacing but it's not sensing the atrial pacing and occasionally sensing is one bit in there uh, in the later part the fourth from the last it seems that there is no pacing at all but there is somewhat failure of the atrial sensing and pacing but ventricular sensing is quite all right what in i like about the answer rubik bhai gave answer sheet because that there is no comment about the ventricular lead that could have been problematic 
Okay. So, and, and the spacing spikes are uh, in the PR segment in the uh, middle complexes. In the, yes. In the so what I have done, this star, I have expanded it. You see that there is a pacing spike. There is no corresponding P wave like here. So it is intermittently failing to capture. No, nothing here. Over here it captured actually and the ventricle captured. And then I have highlighted this. There is a P wave but still there is a pacing complex, a pacing spike. And again, there is a one. This one, one can say, well, it is too close, but this one, there should have been no pacing in the atrium because it should have sensed this. It is a failure of atrial pacing and atrial sensing. Ventricular, I cannot make any comment. Ventricle is capturing this bit. Now, fourth bit is a pseudo fusion. Hmm. And there is another part for our senior physicians here. There are two pacing spike. And I think one is atrium and one is ventricle. Yes. Yes. Why Tushar? I would like this question for Tushar. Why is there a second spike here? Any comment? And why is this such short interval? Well, this is what happened. Short PPM. As this is not sensing the atrium, it is pacing the atrium. And there is a feature built in the pacemaker that if after atrial pacing, there is any sensed ventricular event, it will pace the ventricle at a short interval of 110 milliseconds, which is called safety window pacing or 110 phenomena. Now, this phenomena was very, very important in the days when we had inupola pacing. What would happen? That somebody with complete heart block has the atrial pacing, and atrial pacing spike is seen by the ventricle, and it stopped pacing the ventricle. And it happened quite frequently, and they introduced this feature called safety window pacing. So this is not a malfunction. This is a normal function. Please remember this. Thank you. And Hafiz, please take over. It's nice. Can you see my slide? Yes, yeah, please. Sir. please do a slideshow, Hafiz. Yes. So this is actually uh, the collection from this week. Uh, this was one of our fellow uh, uh, did these cases. 57 year old coming with chest pain. And I let you read the whole thing about the chest pain. Pluritic positional myalgias, patient with hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And this is the initial EKG. So keep that in mind. This is the initial EKG, okay? And this is the laboratory data. White cell count high creatinine normal, troponin 76. I don't know what generation of troponin you are doing, but uh, we are doing fifth generation and now it is in uh, 76,000 per liter. So 76 basically. And then BNP and normal, and then procalcitonin, CRP, you know, and then chest x in the COVID time, I don't know why we are so obsessed about procalcitonin, but in any case, it was normal. CTA negative for dissection PE started on aspirin, heparin, and then this is the subsequent EKG. So keep that in mind because there will be some questions after this. So this is the subsequent EKG, and then this is Further EKG. So look at this one and then look at this change. So, whatever you are thinking, keep that in your mind. This is the echocardiogram. Uh, Hafiz, your slide is not moving. This is, I don't know, no. Hafiz, we did not see the second ECG much. Okay, all right. You can see the EKG now? 
Yes. Okay. I am giving you the history, the way the case evolved. So I'm not playing trick. <laughs> giving you all the information. Can I move, Rafiq Bhai? Yes. yes, I think we saw it. Okay. Echo, this is the echocardiogram done. I did not give all the views, but if you want to know more, I can give you more. This is the echo. It is playing, right? You can see it is playing, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So the next step in the management, you have seen this patient clinical presentation, you have seen the EKG, you have seen the data, and you have seen the echo. The next step in the management is start aspirin and colchicine, start colchicine, cardiac catheterization, temporary pacemaker, ibuprofen and prednisone, vasodilator, non-stressor, pharmacological stress test, assess ischemia. We use uh, the regardinosin, the adenosine agonist for for vasodilation and uh, cardiolite system, maybe nuclear stress test. I mean, I call it vasodilator pharmacology test. So, any any uh, vote on this? Colchicine is uh, getting chance, Bishop. No. Please, can you go back on the ECGs again so that audience can see it? The first, second, third. Okay, this is the last one. No, no, this is echo. This is the last one, yes. Go back, please, again. This one? Yeah, one before. There's no one before. This yes, one, right? Fine. Yes, yeah. yeah. This, this is the first one, yes. Now the second one, please. This is the second one. Yes. And, and this is the third one. Third one, yes. All right, and now yes. I can move. Yes. I can show you the choices that I gave you because this was discussed in the weekend that I was off and I came Monday and then I took over. So there was confusion in the team. So I put all the confusion in a question format. Why didn't you give the choice of cardiac catheterization with temporary pacemaker? Well, uh, Ravik Bhai, sometimes you help with the given the question answer, right? Sometimes <laughs> you help. Sometimes you hard. I'm actually helping you by not giving them very specific and cardiac catheter. Urun Maski, can you make comment? Urun Maski. Yeah, looks like uh, to me, uh, this patient has uh, pericarditis. One. Okay. Uh, and then you saw the last EKG with complete heart block, right? Go to go back. I did not see that last ECG. Okay, so third one, third one, so this one, right? So there is AV dissociation, and the one, okay, one slide yeah. before, no, and this one, yeah. this one, yeah. Hafiz, actually, this ECG that you are showing right now, mm -hmm. it's probably two to one heart block, and the one before. After that is complete heart block. Complete. Yeah. So it has yeah. progressed. So, so uh, Ravi, mm -hmm. just to let you know that this one, I did not make any comment because to me it looked like sinus. But it is. But after looking at this EKG, I went back and I thought this probably two to one. But yes. our EP guys, they did not make any comment, but they all agreed that this is complete heart block with junctional escape narrow. Yeah. That Yes. yes. So, Maski continue. Maski. Yeah. So, so uh, now the question is what do we do? So uh, based on this uh, patient's uh, history, 
possibly this patient has, uh, with the two is to one, it has progressed to complete heart block. And the, from the history, possibly this patient could be a case of uh, myopericarditis. So we will require temporary pacemaker and then we'll have to assess this patient. So uh, I, uh, I don't know anyone has any comment. I actually met this patient in the cath lab because I told them in the morning the patient needs a cath because my thinking was this. If it is a perimyocarditis, that giving bradycardia and complete heart block is actually very rare. Like you can think about Lyme pericarditis or rarely you can see sarcoid type, but not like this. And, and if you look at the troponin and the slide about how troponin rise can differentiate things, at that level of troponin, it is almost impossible to see those kind of myocarditis. However, myocarditis can give you 70 troponin, but it is unlikely that this will give you this bradycardia and, and then uh, troponin of 76. Uh, then the other possibility is that post-MI myocarditis is possible, post-MI pericarditis, I mean, post-MI pericarditis, but in that case, you have to decide that this is um, the uh, coronaries we need to look at. Now, to answer Rafik Bhai's question, why not yeah. I put that? Huh? Can I comment? So if you look yeah. at the first ECG, second ECG, there is first ECG even in lead three, there was some ST elevation. Mm -hmm. And okay. lead second ECG, there is ST elevation in, can you go to the second ECG? Yeah. Okay. There is ST elevation in, in lead AVF. slightly down sloping, but in lead three also in AVF. Very okay. subtle. And there is a Q wave. So somebody developing, and this, even though your panel did your attending didn't think, but I think that was two to one, and then goes into complete heart block with narrow QRS. Lyme disease, one of the things about Lyme disease, Lyme disease is not present in Bangladesh, but it's very common in especially in Maryland, where I live. I don't know how common it is in Nevada, but it is very common. Lyme disease yeah. most of the time will develop complete heart block with white QRS. And, and it, because it, QRS yeah. is narrow here. But yeah. Pravik Bhai, my issue is that when I saw this EKG, look at the lead three, I called it, this is like Wallens equivalent, almost biphasic. And the troponin 76. This, yes. Actually, I argued that this patient was actually a STEMI that they missed. I, I think and so. People, yeah. people who were upset with me, I, I was yelling the fellow that why didn't you activate? Uh, but in any case, the story does not end here. So I okay. took to the cath lab, of course. So, and no, I went, I was, I went with the guide actually, because I knew that there is trouble. But for the interventionalist, the left side was good. My question is, <laughs> and this is going to be an emotional issue. Will you uh, go with the groin and then put a temporary wire or you go with the uh, radial? I'm still on radial. Is that 76 troponin normal or is? No, 76 high, very high. Okay. What's the limit? So, so uh, will you go with the temporary wire or you will be okay without the temporary wire? Um, yeah, Hafid, it depends yeah. on how much gut you have and if you have <laughs> used the bathroom before and or not. <laughs> okay. I mean, somebody with acute infrared MI, 100% occluded RCA, I mean, listen, if you have enough guts, sure. Only concern with the radial is that if you are, let's say in the old days, femoral approach, you already have a, a site there. If you are in trouble, you can quickly put a venous line, right? Yeah. But with the radial, I don't think you can put a line so quickly. But so Ravik, I, by, uh, the interventionalists uh, here would know uh, when we prepare for uh, STEMI patients, yes. even if I'm going radial, yes. as a rule, we, we prep the groin. So if we need to go to the groin and temporary wire, we jump on the groin, it is, it is ready. Well, um, I'll tell you something, Hafiz. 
I mean, I get a lot of patients with complete heart block with white QRS, and I go ahead and put permanent pacemaker without any temporary. Right. I, 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 have, I have issues with that. Um, no, but I'll no, tell you. Really, no, I'll tell you. So, but the, that's the question is, have I run into trouble? Yes. Trouble means as soon as I put the lead in, patient went into complete heart block, yes. asystole, and I used that lead as a temporary. But yes. the, same in this, in this scenario, it's a little bit different because it's a junctional escape rhythm. Yes. And so the AV node, yeah. so that, that may puts it in a little bit more comfortable position without even a temporary. So actually, I was thinking about this conference because I said it's a good case. When I was going to do this, I said I'll show this case on Saturday, mm -hmm. but let me do an experiment. I gave atropine before I put the wire down. What do you think about the atropine we'll use? Because if the atropine, uh, uh, let me see. What do you think? What do you expect? Atropine. I get 0.5 and then 0.5, total one milligram. No harm, actually. No harm, very good. So no harm and no response. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, so I, I wouldn't give atropine because the place that you are, atropine is going to work is already gone. Mm. Yes. And unless you fix the RCA, it's not going to come back. Yeah, you are so right. I actually give atropine with the radial if there is a sinus bradycardia, two to one, wenky back, I usually preemptively now give atropine. In the past, we used to give atropine after. I give preemptively so that I don't need temporary wear, although I have growing prep. For the interventionalist who are doing the STEMI, my advice is that don't be too brave. At least put a venous line for, for ready to put a temporary wear. You don't need to be too brave, but, but I, I did reckless anyway, and I, I gave dopamine after this. And after the dopamine, I said, if that increases the heart rate, then I'm not going to put a temporary wire. So I used dopamine, and then I put the wire, and no further bradycardia. Actually, with the dopamine, the, the, uh, the, the sinus note came back. It was sinus tack, as you can see. And then, and then the patient's EKG came like this. I don't think it was the dopamine, it was the vessel opening up that did it. Both ways, yes. I will not be able to. But now question is, what do you do now? As far as the, uh, the heart block is concerned? Yeah. Nothing. So nothing. So the patient goes home. And then no, we because, prove. OK, OK. I'll give you this scenario. Inferior myocardial infarction. If the AV node artery is involved, you can develop heart block. And that damage, most of the time, is not permanent. So once you have intervened and it has come back, even if it did not come back today, I will wait at least 48 hours to see if it has come back. That will not be true for anterior myocardial infarction. Yes. If anterior Infarction conduction did not come back same day. It is unlikely that it will come back again. Actually, so, anterior, Rafik, by in our guidelines, anterior with complete heart block will be like a, um, I should not say this. Someone will be stupid not to put a temporary wire exactly. um, because you it, it, that you can't rely. Only reason I tried this because the junctional escape was narrow. And I thought that let's take a chance. But you need to be careful about ready to roll with the temporary wear. And then post revascularization, you need to observe the patient and then uh, not to just send um, hours after the intervention, just wait, watch 36, 48 hours, and then send home. Let me do a quick patient because this is a very interesting one. 34 year old found confused and admitted with vomiting. There was a suspicion for, you know, bone has esophageal rupture, but that was not the case. Patient was found to be diabetic, has history of uh, substance abuse, and this is the EKG. This is the EKG. Any comment from anyone?
Only for me. Three term non specific change. Yes, yes. And, and then look at the QT. QT is very prolonged. Hmm. Patient was diagnosed to have hyperosmolar diabetic state. And then <laughs> this is their blood count glucose 1350, magnesium was low, and then uh, the UDS, urine toxic screen was uh, methamphetamine. And uh, patient was shown to have sinus bradycardia overnight, and this was the tele script. Ah, a long QT. Do you have a longer recent? We want to see whether it's a, a, a torsa. You can see the twist, Vadud. Yeah, the but twist. you would have been shown it beautifully. Yeah. Okay. So now, what do you do? Can, can you show again the clinical scenario, please? Calcium and magnesium. That's um, less important. The, the clinical scenario? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, confused and then uh, vomiting, then diagnosis of hyperosmolar diabetic state. This is the blood uh, magnesium, potassium 3.1, kidney normal, sinus bradycardia, but I don't have that rhythm. And then this. <laughs> Potassium magnesium replacement. So number one, Habib Bhai. Yeah. Number A. Yeah. So even the magnesium level low or uh, normal, some will give the magnesium first. This is a very common board question in internal medicine that give ICD, which is wrong. And there is no need for cardiac cath or anything. So, um, and then avoid all this. Yes. And then I will give you finish with the last case. I can, make a can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of us should be careful about uh, diabetic ketosis disease and other things because whenever we are actually controlling the blood sugar, our uh, potassium level will dramatically fall down and the patient may have arrhythmias. We should all pay, pay attention to that. All and, and by the way, I just wanted to tell you that sometimes it happened to us. Thanks, they, did the, uh, they, they used the loperamide and then QT prolongation and then they used this for detention of the uh, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And in this case, potassium, magnesium correction may not work. And sometimes you need a, a temporary wear pacemaker to overdrive pace to get out of this uh, episodes of polymorphic VT. So this is a patient from Kansas and then uh, came in to us for AFI, and then this is a pharmacology issue. Patient was on Coumadin, Sotalol, Hydralazine, Losartan, and then this EKG. Lead three to show, show uh, seem to show there is some. Uh, yeah, actually, lead two shows the best because uh, what happened? These patients had sotalol. Yeah. Look at eighty-year-old. It is a renally cleared, renal function deteriorated, and then he developed this long QT, and also uh, looks like there is a. Two to one block. A phrase. Can I comment on this? Yes, yes. Okay. So this basically, if you look at the first two bits, sinus rhythm, uh, PR interval about 220 millisecond, QRS normal, QT actually is not prolonged. It's about 
480 milliseconds. <laughs> okay, so what's happening in this? This is a classic case where a patient will end up getting a pacemaker when they don't need it. Because what's happening? Look at the first T wave, rounded. Second T wave is a pointed. That means there is a premature beat. Yes. So it's a classic example of sinus rhythm with supraventricular premature beat in a pattern of bigemini which is not conducted. And physicians keep sending me these patients to put a pacemaker in. I keep refusing putting pacemaker in these patients. And, and uh, in this case, there was an offending agent and we just need to sit tight. And then this happened before discharge. I am, so, I am not so, I am not so sure that the sotalol was the culprit in this case. Yeah, definitely, definitely Ravik Bhai. Sotalol, this is notorious for uh, its metabolism and, and then got accumulated because of the worsening renal failure. No, and no. But the elderly lady with the renal clearance problem, only thing we did is stop the sotalol and the EKG returned to like this. Okay, this is what I would recommend. This patient, if you do 30 day heart monitor, you will see again multiple places. She will have non conducted P waves. So, stopping sotalol is a good idea because with the renal impairment, it's almost impossible, especially in older patients, to maintain. I mean, sometimes I will give sotalol in renal failure patients once, once a day or once every 48 hours, 72 hours. That's very cumbersome to do. But those right. non conductivity waves are probably, yeah. So this patient did go with a telemonitoring 30 day, and then we'll follow up in the office. If I could not convince you with this one, let me show you this one, then quick one. 90 year old, <laughs> it came in <laughs> so 90 year old. And then look at this patient is on aliquis, amlodipine, synthroid and diltiazem, and then had this, okay? So this was in another hospital. Uh, right bundle, left axis, AFib, and then they, they evaluated, we got the record, and there's nothing much there. So then the cardio, the, this was the TE at the time. And then, and then after, the, after this uh, cardio version, patient was uh, following up with the cardiologist and we don't know because 90 year old, she doesn't know what she's taking. And she came with this. Uh, Hafidha, what is Eliquis? Okay, sorry, uh, Epixaban. Yeah. Uh -huh. What medicine she was taking? So we found up with the uh, medications. Patient was taking uh, amiodron, digoxin, and... Uh, oh. Or metoprolol. Anyway, I have to say goodbye. I have, um, if you don't mind. Okay, okay. okay. So this time okay, I agree with you. This time I will agree with you. Whatever you decide. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week. So, well, the, my problem is that uh, I have to follow up the patient. So <laughs> and, and and the safety issue. Last patient, uh, we did not put any temporary wire or anything. Our pacemaker uh, will be following up in the office. What about this one, Wadud? Uh, the, have you uh, discontinued the drug and putting a temporary? Yeah, yeah. The, no. the patient came in with bradycardia. This was the admission EKG. Yeah. We stopped everything. And now this is like 10 o'clock. And unfortunately, I was called in for another patient with cardiogenic shock and, uh, and a missed uh, anterior wall STEMI. So I was putting a balloon pump and all that. I told my... Uh, uh, ex fellow, now my partner, to deal with. And he could not get hold of me, so she was wondering what to do. And therefore, I'm giving you the choices. Because I'm she right. said, uh, yeah. No, actually, when I, as per the guideline, whether the, the patient was taking the rate lowering drug like the uh, digoxin, then. Yeah. Uh, all are stopped now. All, all are stopped. Whether, how much the drugs are essential? If there is no alternative, then you have to think for the 
permanent pacemaker, whether the drugs are essential, can you stop this drug permanently? Atarbhai, I totally agree with you, but my question is, what you do tonight? Because I'll, this is temporary, temporary. Okay. Because so remember, last time we did not give temporary. What I'm bringing this issue up for the junior doctor, that in the last case, we did not put temporary, but in this case, as Atarbhai is rightly suggesting, that this is a temporary, but both occasions, patient has blood pressure, good blood pressure, patient is still maintaining. But why we would be putting a temporary wire in this one, we did not put a temporary wire in last one. What will be the points in favor and points against? This patient has right bundle branch block with the left anterior hemi block. She is very likely to, and also uh, now has developed a very slow uh, rhythm. So this patient is at risk for developing a systole or complete heart block and persistent very uh, low uh, ventricular rate. Exactly. This patient, you know, the is unreliable. Yes, and exactly. The block is probably infra and unreliable. Right. So exactly. we cannot take a chance. If this patient goes into trouble, then we'll be liable. So um, Rufik Bhai is not here. I was going to ask Rufik Bhai that, will you put it? permanent pacemaker or will you do a temporary wear? Um, I would do a temporary wear. Yeah. Let's see that the that the uh, blocks go away. But but here is the thing. The EP guys will argue that there is significant conduction disease anyway. And this thing will come up that if we have a problem with the rhythm control or rate control, can we give the drug later on? So uh, that will be something, you know, I will ask Atharvai to make a comment. Yeah. And initially, I will put that temporary pacemaker first, then I will reevaluate. I will think about the drugs that is a amiodarone, digoxin, how much these drugs are essential. If there is an alternative choice for this drug, then permanent pacemaker is as per the guidelines it is required. Yeah. But if there is alternative, if you can just stop this drug permanently as per the clinical scenario, then we can avoid the permanent pacemaker. But if these drugs are essential, like the digoxin and like this, then permanent pacemaker is a choice. Afiz Bhai, why must she give, give an epic zaban? Oh, yes. the atrial fibrillation. And then we have to go give beta blocker in future. So I think she requires a permanent pacemaker as well. So remember, this was his uh, his initial initial uh, EKG in the another hospital with the AFE right bundle left axis. So she has bifascicular block from before. Now with the medications gotten worse. So I do not know what we'll do yet because we just kept temporary wear last uh, yesterday. Our EP guys uh, said uh, no pacemaker. He's rounding today. So he, they changed their mind. So I hope that they put it a permanent pacemaker. <laughs> I told them, <laughs> I told them no way you can get away with the permanent pacemaker with this. Echo is normal, uh, LV function. So I have that all. all right. Thank you, sir. Mosin, do you want to make a I have one question. How often you use amidarone, metoprolol, and digoxin in one patient? I, I, I almost never use. I This is to me, is I think there is a, and I'm sure that with all due respect, whoever was treating in the other hospital, they probably did not want that way because three AV blocking agent is going to be a disaster, particularly a 90 year old. But the patient has memory deficit and did not, want, did not remember what medications to take and what not to take. So they changed so much that there was a uh, problem with the patient's understanding of the medications. Uh, thank you, Habib. Nine beautiful cases. Uh, Firoz, to me, I'm here to take off. Is it your to be? Thank you. Because really. Firoz. What is it? Actually, each is of the week. Actually, the each is was presented by that uh, posted by uh, Dr. Sadi, but he is not here in the screen. Tell it. I think I we should wait for him. Right. I I, I think I should not discuss the ECG today, Firoz. Okay. He's absent. We can discuss it on the next day. Yeah. Okay. We can do that. So, so, yeah. yeah, I, took, I took longer uh, probably today. Oh, thank, thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are almost at the end of our session. Yeah. Uh, Atar sir, your final comments. So it was a very nice session today. We have got the good number of the uh, pediatric cardiologist and uh, Dr. Jamil. Sir. Again, thank you very much for your nice presentation. You're welcome. You have stimulated us and stimulate the pediatric cardiologist. And again, we are having the another pediatric ECD session in the next day. They are participating. The next Saturday, the presenter will be Dr. Rezo Narima and Naharuma. And Dr. Zamil, Sir. you will fight on that day. I think we will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, uh, Dr. Uh, Choudhury Hafiz, we are very much glad to have your ECD. Very nice presentation today. Excellent, excellent ECD. And we want to see uh, like this is again and again. So very happy. Thank you very much for your excellent participation. And we can see Dr. Mahabu Rahman. Dr. Mahabu Rahman Babu. We did not see you for the last few sir, minutes. Just, thank you, sir. No, 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 no. Actually, we did not see you last few sir. sessions, but today we are very much happy to see you, Dr. Babu. Do you want to end the comment? Sir, I, I, I was late today. I missed almost today also. But I don't want to miss this session. Thank you, sir. All are nice. You're... Babu, don't miss on next Saturday. Stay yes, yes. As I possibly there yeah, is also... Inshallah. Swami Powdell. We want to thank you. Thank and you finally, Shabir. thanks all the participants and the... For, the, for today's excellent session. And Abdul Wadud Choudhury. And Mohsin Hussain. Urmila and uh, Morish from the Nepal. Thank you, everybody. What was it? And Orun Maski. Hey, Orun Maski, yes. Orun Maski is always there. Orun Maski, you please keep some of the ECCs every day. No problem. If there is any time, we can see your ECC. You are, your presentation is always uh, excellent. We enjoy your presentation. So, Firoz, you can conclude the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you, all of you. And we are at the end of session. It's 11.10. We'll wait for another seven days. Next Saturday, we'll look for some uh, ECG changes in different pathological conditions. Dr. Naruma and Dr. Rejwana is going to are going to present the ECGs. And till then, night. And stay safe. Thank you very much. Saira, to me, Invite Kuru. Acha, tu me hachi je Rejwana Rima Ebang Nahar Uwa ji invitation at your party. For the next Saturday. Okay, sir. Okay, thik hachi, sir. Thik. Bithur also, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Anis hachi. Anis ke bis kori. Ami anis ke dehi ne askar. Oh, tairo yasak. Good to be. Kuru yasak. Yato sesha.